Welcome to NFL Imperialism. You may have seen this concept floating around YouTube, but I wanted to put my own spin on it by going through every season in the Super Bowl era and hopefully improving upon it. Before we get going, I humbly ask that you consider subscribing to the channel and dinging that bell icon for notifications. This is the channel's primary series, but we do other things as well in both the sports and the entertainment world. We're so glad you're here. Thank you very much. If you're interested in a full thorough breakdown of how imperialism works, feel free to take a look at the first three or so minutes of our initial video of the 1966 season. That video is linked on its own in the description below. Right beneath that is a link to a playlist of all completed imperialism videos to date. Otherwise, we're ready to start. With the 1980s now in the rearview mirror, we focus our attention to a new decade and the 1990 season that kicked it off. The NFL underwent some change this season, expanding the playoffs to 12 teams, or 6 per conference. Now only two division winners would get a bye in the playoffs, and a third division winner would play in the wildcard round. 1990 also saw the emergence of some new powers and the return of others. After four seasons, the New York Giants returned to the NFL mountaintop, winning the Silver Jubilee Super Bowl, Super Bowl 25, over the Buffalo Bills. We ought to get used to seeing the Bills in this runner-up spot. They will be here for each of the next three seasons. To date, this is the only Super Bowl decided by a single point, and by definition, will forever remain an all-time record, only able to be tied. Despite losing the game, the Bills rank out as 1990's number one team, with the Giants coming in second. The Chiefs joined the Bills as breakout teams from 1989 imperialism that reached this top five. The Niners remain a top five team, joined by their California brethren, the Los Angeles Raiders. The Rams and the Browns fall from grace and enter the bottom five, with the bottom spot occupied by the geographically gifted New England Patriots. It's time to take this to the field. 1990 imperialism is now underway. The wheel is being rather insistent that the Jets be in this game. After expanding, that arrow is going to point down south to the eastern portion of the Redskins territory. Jets at Redskins coming up now. The Jets lead 12-7 in the second quarter from the Redskins 24. Play action. Ken O'Brien fires to Rob Moore, makes the catch in the end zone despite the coverage. That touchdown will give the Jets an 18-7 lead. They miss the extra point. Each team tacks on a field goal. It's now 21-10 in the fourth. Only a minute 25 to go. Third and goal from the one. Rippon's going to throw to Art Monk. He makes the catch in the back of the end zone. Washington will kick the extra point. The score is now 21-17, and it's all going to depend on this onside kick. Here it comes, and Jets center Jim Sweeney will make the recovery. That will give the Jets a non-traditional 21 points here in this game. 21-17 is the final. The Redskins are set to be a force to be reckoned with in next season's imperialism. In this one, they're the first team to go down. The Jets take over their territory and expand their land. Like the Jets before them, the wheel now insists that the Chargers play. They get one expansion, and now they're being sent into Arizona to face the Phoenix Cardinals. The Chargers jump out to a 7-0 lead in the first quarter. Still in the first quarter looking for more. This touchdown pass is going to go to Ronnie Harmon, and the Chargers are all over them now. It's 14 to nothing. We're going to fast forward this game to late in the fourth quarter. It's 17-7. The Cardinals have a chance to get a little closer from the 13. Tim Rosenbach is going to look for tailback Johnny Johnson. Nice throw, nice catch, and this game is now 17-13. Missed extra point in this one here. Onside kick time, Al Del Greco is going to lay it down, and the Cardinals recover, but they quickly are facing fourth and 14. Only 18 seconds remain. 
Rosenback's going to look for Johnson. Same play as the touchdown. This is going to be well short, though. He goes down 31 yards away. The Chargers are going to win this game 17-13. These parallels between the Jets and Chargers are pretty amazing. One expansion, one invasion, take a big lead, give up a touchdown late, but win by four. That's exactly what happened here. The state of Arizona is going to fall to the Chargers, and they get their first imperialism win since 1982. Our pattern of one expansion, one game continues. The Green Bay Packers are invading the territory of their division rival, the Minnesota Vikings. And it's not going well. The Vikings have the ball right at the edge of the goal line. Rich Gannon is going to actually throw this ball into double coverage, but Anthony Carter's on the other side, so that's okay. He makes the catch, scores a touchdown. The Vikings extend the lead to 24-3, went back and forth in the fourth quarter. The Vikings walk out with a 38-10 victory. We get our first failed invasion in 1990 imperialism. The Vikings will take over the Packers' territory, and they are one win away from 50 overall. For the second straight game, we're getting a divisional matchup. The reigning imperialism champion Cincinnati Bengals travel to Cleveland to face the Browns. We've had corrupted footage before, we've had lost footage before. This time, my hands up in the air. I never hit the record button. I realized just as the game was ending and I at least captured the end of it. It looks like the Bengals fell behind early but were able to pull away by the end, winning this game by a score of 24-7. The 1990s is a rough decade for the Bengals franchise, but in 1990, they were still pretty good. They get this win, they take over the state of Ohio all for themselves, and they're still alive to defend their crown. We head back to the wheel. It will be landing on the Dallas Cowboys, and that arrow's actually taking them into the Houston Oilers territory only for the second time in 25 years of imperialism will this game be in Houston. And it probably didn't matter at the end where this game was. The Oilers came out, took control of it, lead 14 to nothing here early in the third quarter. Warren Moon fires deep to Haywood Jeffries. That's going to be a touchdown, making this a 21-0 game. The Oilers' passing attack was virtually unstoppable in this one. Dallas pulled a couple late when it didn't really matter. Houston won this game 42-14. The Cowboys emerged from last season's position as number one in the bottom five to a more respectable 7-9 team, but they're not there yet. The Oilers take this victory, take the state of Texas, and the Cowboys are on a bit of a losing streak in imperialism unlike anything they've seen before. The wheel's gonna make it easy on us for this one. It's landing on the Dolphins. That takes them automatically into the next team over, which in this case is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This game was tight for a while, but the Dolphins now lead by a touchdown in the fourth quarter. Dan Marino is gonna throw it to Mark Clayton to add another touchdown. That will give the Dolphins a 21 to seven lead. And before it's all said and done, they will add yet another touchdown, giving us our final score of 28 to seven. The Dolphins wind up winning this game by a comfortable margin. They take over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers territory and own the state of Florida. Six teams have been bounced from imperialism this season. The Rams land on the wheel. They'll head to the Southeast. The San Diego Chargers will become the first team to take the field twice this season. They'll host the Rams. Up by a touchdown, the Chargers face third and goal from the 14-yard line. They're going to run it to Marion Butts, maybe settling for a field goal, but Butts has other ideas. He gets in for the touchdown. Great play for the Chargers. That really is what separates them from the Rams in this game. 
They extend to 17 to 3 right there. They finish with a final score victory of 27-10. The 1990 San Diego Chargers weren't anything special, but they could run the ball and play defense. That could take them further than might be expected. They will take over the Rams' territory, and they are indeed the first team to now win twice in 1990 Imperialism. The wheel selects the Chicago Bears, sending them to face off with the Indianapolis Colts. Trailing 16-7, the Colts are looking to make a comeback in the fourth quarter. Jeff George is going to try to squeeze this into Eric Dickerson, but it's intercepted by Mark Carrier, who easily runs it back in for the touchdown. That will certainly end the Colts' comeback hopes. The Bears lead this game now. 23-7, and 23-7 will indeed be the final score. Although not as good as they were in 85, this Bears team can play some defense and run the football. That makes for a good formula. They take the Colts off the map, expanding their land into the state of Indiana. 20 teams now remain in imperialism. This wheel lands on the Steelers. They're going to head straight east. We're going to get the Battle of Pennsylvania here. The Eagles will host the Steelers. After some back and forth in the first quarter, the Eagles are inside the one. Anthony Tony right up the middle for the touchdown, breaking the gridlock of this game. The Eagles will take a 7-0 lead. It is now 7-3. The Eagles have the ball again. First and 10 back at their own 22. Hand off to Keith Byers. He's blown up. Hardy Nickerson forces the fumble, recovers the fumble, and scores the touchdown. The Steelers' defense steps up in a huge way, giving them a 10-7 lead that they're going to take into halftime. We're now in the third quarter. The Eagles have third and 19. Play action. Cunningham lifts it up to Calvin Williams, makes a diving catch, and as he does so, he gets into the end zone. What a play there, 14-10. It's now Pittsburgh's turn to do something. From the 30-yard line, Bubby Brister hands off to Tim Worley. He picks up a lot of yards. He's going to get it inside the 10-yard line as the third quarter expires. Now in the fourth quarter, second and goal from the six. It's going to be Worley again facing opposition, but he breaks through, dives in, gets the touchdown. Now the Steelers have retaken the lead in this seesaw game. 17-14, now it's Philly from their own 28-yard line. Third and 10, Cunningham again looks deep for Calvin Williams, gets a lot of yards after the catch. They finally get him down 46 yards on that play. It is now third and goal from the three. The Steelers back up the defense, leaving the middle open for Anthony Tony. his second touchdown of the game. The Eagles have retaken this lead 21-17. It's going to be on the Steelers to try to get this back. Fourth and one handoff is going to go to Merrill Hodge. Easily picks up the first down. Bubby Brister's been knocked out of the game. It is third and 13, third and 12. Rick Strom is in there, faces the pressure, gets it off to Hodge, and he picks up the first down. But the Steelers go backwards here, third and 13 again. The Eagles bring the D up. Jerome Brown forcing some pressure, and they've got a hold of him. Not down yet. There he is, Brown with the sack. It's fourth and 21. This is going to be tough. Strom in there cold with nine seconds to go. Backs up in the pocket, throws to Lewis Lips, incomplete. And the Eagles win this game 21-17. On the face of it to some, 38 total points isn't overly exciting. But that game was a thriller. The Eagles proved dominance in Pennsylvania. They take over the Steelers' land. And they're going to hope to maybe not have to play again soon because they left a lot on that field. The top five Kansas City Chiefs will be taking the field for the first time, traveling to Minnesota to play the Vikings. 
And it's not gone well. The Chiefs offense has been stymied by the Vikings' relentless pass rush. Here with a 14-0 lead, Rich Gannon fires deep to Anthony Carter. He's going to outrun everybody into the end zone. Touchdown from 55 yards out, extending the Viking lead to 21-0. And they, in a laugher, take this game 28-3. The Minnesota Vikings just seem to have that knack for winning in imperialism. They now join the Dallas Cowboys as the first franchise to win 50 games, and they did it by the 25th season, averaging two per year. They will take over the Chiefs' land, knocking out a top five team, and they have announced their presence yet again. The Chargers have had a good run to this point, but they must now welcome the San Francisco 49ers. This will easily be their biggest test. And the 49ers waste no time in the first quarter. It's third and eight. Who might Joe Montana be looking for here? Yep, that's Jerry Rice going up to get it. Gets away from about four defenders. They finally get him down at the one yard line. One play later, Roger Craig up the middle for the touchdown. And the 49ers have jumped out to a 7-0 lead. It is now 10-0 in the second half. The Chargers looking to make some kind of comeback. Third and 12. Billy Joe Tolliver picks up a nice block in the backfield. We'll find Anthony Miller for the touchdown. That'll cut the lead down to 10-7. And the 49ers appear to have trouble with wide receivers named Anthony. First it was Carter, now it's going to be Anthony Miller, third and 13, no pass rush, Tolliver throws to Miller, makes the catch, it's going to be a foot race to the end zone, he's out past the 10 yard line, they get him down at the 6, it's still 10 to 7 here, Anthony Miller makes this catch and gets into the end zone, and the Chargers have now jumped out to a 14 to 10 lead. The 49ers are going to have to make a comeback. They face third down. Four minutes to go in the game. Montana overthrows Jerry Rice. Martin Bayless with the interception. This is Montana's third pick of this game. Bayless continues to run it back. Credit to Montana for going to make the tackle. The Niners will look to hold San Diego to a field goal here. Third and goal from the six. They're going to run it to Marion Butts. They converge, but he's able to slither through for the touchdown. And with about two and a half minutes to go, the Chargers have an 11-point lead. The Niners do drive it down. Fourth and goal from the nine-yard line. Montana quickly escapes the pocket. He's going to run it in for the touchdown. That will make this 21-16. to The 49ers go for two and do not get it. It's going to land all here on the onside kick. The kick is down, and the Chargers recover. And in what can only be described as a shocking upset, the Chargers defeat the 49ers 21-16. There's a little bit to unpack here. We're going to get the first thing out of the way. The Chargers win this game, and in doing so, will take the 49ers off the map. This is the 49ers' first one and done since 1982. The Chargers win their third game in imperialism, the most they've ever had in a single season. And that game by Joe Montana will be his last in a 49er uniform in imperialism. This wheel sure does love the Chargers. In only our 12th game, they'll be taking the field for the fourth time. This time, they're traveling to the Great Northwest to face the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle's moving the ball in the first quarter. They've taken it down to the Charger 25-yard line. 
Play action. Dave Craig rolls out, finds John L. Williams, breaks a tackle, will get it down inside the one. They'll let Williams finish it off on the next play. The Seahawks, as the 49ers did, jump out to a 7-0 lead. We're going to move ahead to the third quarter. Seahawks lead 10-3 with the ball in Charger territory. Another play action. This time, Craig's going to find receiver Tommy Kane makes the catch, but Gilbert comes through and forces the fumble. The opportunistic Chargers defense strikes again. After a couple of downfield passes to Anthony Miller from the three-yard line, it's going to be Marion Butts. The bulldozer gets his way in. The Chargers are going to tie this game up at 10 apiece despite not having done much to this point. Wow, the Chargers just cannot be put away. Now they've got the ball a minute 14 to go. This pitch will go to Ronnie Harmon. He gets them in field goal range and a lot more. Takes them down to about the 12. That'll line up a game-winning field goal attempt from John Carney. 23 yards out. The pressure comes. They're unable to block it, but Carney misses. And we're going to be headed to overtime, tied up at 10 apiece. The Chargers get the ball first, and they've already moved it down to the 37. Marion Butts goes up the middle, and he has the Chargers in field goal range. But they want a little bit more. Next play from the 24-yard line. Butts around left end. He gets away. He might score this himself. They get him down. At about the five. So now they're going to trot Carney out again. Again from 23 yards. Again the pressure comes. Again the kick gets off. But this time it's good. And the San Diego Chargers win again. This time in Seattle in overtime. 13 to 10. We've had some impressive runs in Imperialism, but this San Diego Chargers team in 1990 is creeping up toward the top of that list. Imagine what it would look like if they can finish things off. They take over the Seahawks territory, and they essentially own the entire West Coast except for the Raiders just kind of sitting there in the middle of all things. Interesting to see how this will play out. Let's see what the wheel has in store for us next. It's gonna be landing on the Detroit Lions, sending them to the southwest into the home of their NFC Central rival, the Chicago Bears. The Bears have the ball trailing 13-3 in the third quarter. Quarterback Jim Harbaugh looks for James Thornton. It's picked off by Ray Crockett. He gets away from a couple of guys. He gets taken down at the 12-yard line. Great play by Crockett there. The Lions have taken it down to the one. They're going to give it to Barry Sanders on a draw for the touchdown. That's going to put the Lions ahead 20-3. to The question here is, do the Bears have the offense to make a comeback here? Well, they've taken it down to the 14-yard line. Harbaugh is going to lift it up to Ron Morris. That's a nicely placed pass. Touchdown, Bears. The comeback begins, perhaps. It is now... 20 to 9 where normally reliable kicker Kevin Butler will miss the extra point so it's going to stay 20 to 9. The Lions now they're in the fourth quarter and they're going to be airing it out here. Rodney Pete steps up in the pocket, throws it deep and it's picked off by Sean Gale. He gets away, avoids the tackle. He's weaving in and out looking like Ed Reed there running this back. He's inside the 10 yard line. They take him down though. Okay, the Bears have a chance. Maybe they don't need their offense to make this comeback. The defense will do it for them. Third and goal from the one. Brad Muster up the middle. Touchdown, Chicago. Kevin Butler will make this extra point. And the score is now 20-16. to The Lions get the ball back. They're going to be throwing it again. And it's intercepted by Mark Carrier. They're airing it out. Barry Sanders isn't the type to grind the clock down. That'll give the ball back to the Bears. They're facing third and 12. The Lions bring the defense up. That'll give Harbaugh the chance to throw it. Those are short of the sticks to Ron Morris, but Morris will pick up the first down. They're in the red zone on that play. They're now at the 12-yard line, 13-yard line, third and four. Harbaugh finds James Thornton in the middle. He runs it in, and with a minute five to go, the Bears who were trailing 20-3, now lead 
23 to 20. There's still time left for the Lions. They've gotten it down to the 42 yard line. They're gonna pitch it to Sanders. He's gonna pick up a good number of yards there. It's down to the 34. They're in field goal range, but they're gonna go ahead and leave the offense on the field. Okay, from the 34, 35 yard line, in the shotgun, Rodney Pete is gonna throw to Terry Greer. That's a typo there, it's a greet. <laughs> they're still going to try the offense here. Rodney Pete gets taken down immediately. They don't bring out their kicker, and the Lions lose the game more than the Bears win it. Final score, Chicago 23, Detroit 20. The Lions have been one of Imperialism's most successful teams over the seasons, but these Lions are the ones that most fans are used to. The Bears beat them, they take over the state of Michigan, expanding their land and getting us down to the final 15 teams. The wheels seeing fit to give us games, we'll get one here as well. The Eagles are going to be traveling to the southeast. That's going to hit the now larger territory of the New York Jets. The Jets were hanging in in this one, but it's now 14-7, three minutes to go in the half. He fires around right and goes untouched, 10 yards for the touchdown. This was part of a 286-yard rushing performance for the Eagles as a team. They laid down the hammer in this one, 40-7, final score. In this Buddy Ryan era of the Eagles in Imperialism, this has been by far the most complete performance they've put out. They take over the Jets' territory with this emphatic victory, and maybe this is the year where they make some noise. Half of the NFL's teams have been eliminated, half remain. The Bears are chosen once again. They're going to head to the Southwest. That's going to catch the territory of the Minnesota Vikings. Whoever wins this game is going to have a nice chunk of land. Welcome to the Anthony Carter Show. That was his first touchdown of the game. This was his second, and yes, this was his third. Easy to forget just how good he was, partially because the Vikings had another great receiver named Carter. That touchdown made it 21-7. The teams exchanged touchdowns before the end of the game. The Vikings win 28-14. The Bears did what they could in this one. The Vikings were just too much. They take over the Bears' land, and between them and the Chargers, they might have the largest land in the country right now. The Miami Dolphins come up on the wheel and they will go to Atlanta and face the Falcons. We're tied up at 7 late in the first half. Dolphins in the red zone. This is play action. Marino rolls out, finds fullback Tony Page. He gets into the end zone. The Dolphins will take a 14-7 lead and they will take that lead into the second half. They have the ball once again from their own 46. They'll be looking to score on this drive, extend the lead. Dan Marino gets sacked, run over by Torrey Epps. That ball is loose and the Falcons will recover it, run it back to the 24-yard line. The very first play after the turnover, Chris Miller, he's going to look for Michael Haynes. He is getting under that ball, scoring the touchdown. Quick turnaround here for the Falcons. This game is now tied up at 14 apiece. We head to the fourth quarter. Two minutes to go from the 23 under immense pressure. Pass gets off to Floyd Dixon in for the injured Andre Risen. It is now third and goal from the 10. They are in field goal range for sure, but the Falcons are looking for the end zone. Miller to Haynes once again for the touchdown. The Falcons who trailed 14-7 at the half now lead 21-14 Miami in desperate straits, fourth and 19 from their own four yard line. Marino throws short to Mark Duber, that went nowhere. And the Miami Dolphins blow this game. The Falcons hold the homeland, winning 21 to 14. Usually whenever a team from Florida winds up playing the Falcons in imperialism, it means a lot because getting the win not only eliminates the other team, as the Falcons have done to the Dolphins, but it puts the winning team, in this case the Falcons, 
in isolation. For the first time this season, we're getting the number one and number two teams in our rankings on the field. They're playing against each other in a Super Bowl rematch. The New York Giants travel to Buffalo to face the Bills. The Bills get it right on it in the first quarter. Three minutes to go, 31-yard line. Jim Kelly is going to throw it deep to Andre Reid. He extends for the catch, and in doing so, he crosses the plane, gets on the board for the Bills, it's seven to nothing. The Giants respond back with a long drive. Get it down to the three yard line. Phil Sims will find Mark Ingram in the back of the end zone. That's a touchdown. We're tied up at seven apiece. But after that beginning, this game turned into a defensive battle. It's still seven seven in the third quarter. From the 48 yard line, the Giants bring their defense up. The Bills run Thurman Thomas anyway. He spins away from some defenders, spins away for some more, creates some space, and gets it down to the three-yard line. The Bills are in striking distance. It is now third and goal from the two. In the shotgun, this handoff to Jamie Mueller is botched, and the Giants are going to fall on this loose ball. Buffalo is able to get it back, though. 345 left in the game. From the Giant 27, Jim Kelly will throw it up to James Lofton. He dives and makes the catch. They keep him out of the end zone somehow. First and goal now becomes third and goal from the two. The hand goes to Thurman Thomas, cuts back inside. This time he scores. We have our first score since the first quarter. The Bills lead 14 to 7. Here come the Giants. From Buffalo's 45-yard line, Phil Sims is going to look again for Mark Ingram. He goes up and makes the catch. He gets taken down at the 12-yard line. After an incompletion and a sack, they're at the 20-yard line. Phil Sims is going to look for Ingram again, but that pass is off target, and it's picked off by Leonard Smith. The Bills run out the clock from here. And they get their revenge from the Super Bowl in this game with a 14-7 victory. Pretty unique stat here. The last three games have seen zero field goals. Touchdowns all around. Not too many in this game. Three were scored, but Buffalo got two of them. By doing so, they knocked the Giants out of the game, taking over their land. And the Giants and their two Super Bowl winning seasons in imperialism have gone one and done. The wheel lands on the Raiders who are completely enveloped by the Chargers territory. Can the Chargers continue their run by knocking out a second top five team? The Raiders lead seven to three in the second quarter. First and goal from the six. Jay Schrader rolls out, will find Willie Galt in the end zone, does a little moonwalk after making the catch. The Chargers have fallen behind 14 to three. In other words, they have the Raiders exactly where they want them. Maybe. It's still 14-3. Steve Smith up the middle. That ball is jarred loose. It's bouncing around. Who is going to recover it? And the Chargers do, so they get to stay in this game. We're now in the third quarter. Still 14-3. From just behind the 50-yard line, Billy Joe Tolliver goes deep to Anthony Miller, and he'll make the catch, taken down at around the 10-11-yard line. Second down now from the 8-yard line. Tolliver under pressure. Gets it away to tight end Derek Walker. He will do the rest. And don't look now. The Chargers are trying to make another comeback. 14-10. The Raiders with another chance to put this away. They've got it down to the Charger 2. Steve Smith up the middle. Leslie O'Neal makes an incredible diving tackle. And instead of going for it, the Raiders are going to bring out kicker Jeff Jager. For the essentially extra point here, 19-yard field goal attempt is good. The Raiders lead 17-10 instead of 21-10.
This pass goes deep to Willie Galt for the Raiders. He gets it down to the 70. Fumbles! Another chance to put it away. They can't do it. And San Diego recovers a second fumble inside the 10-yard line. The Chargers have new life again. It's 4th and 10, though. Minute 46 to go. Tolliver will quickly dump this off to Ronnie Harmon. Not a great decision, but Harmon will break the tackle and get the first down. They continued breathing. They've got it down now to the 19-yard line. Tolliver throws to Anthony Miller, and he scores, and he does his own version of the moonwalk. Unbelievable. The Chargers are going to be going to overtime for the second time in this imperialism, tied at 17 with the Raiders. After an exchange of punch, the Raiders have it third and five on the Charger 45. Schrader, he's going to look for Willie Gall. He makes the catch and escapes the defenders. Gets it down to approximately the 16-yard line. And they're going to bring out Jager right away from 34 yards out. The kick is up. It's good. And the Raiders survive themselves and the Chargers winning this game 20-17 in overtime. The run ends here for the San Diego Chargers, but what a run it was with some crazy upsets. They had won six games in 24 imperialism seasons before getting four this season. They did not get their fifth. The Raiders take over their land, and they went from a team that was just kind of hanging out there to perhaps the biggest landmass in the country. Just 10 teams remain. The Bengals will get called up, and they're going to head to the Northeast. That's actually going to bypass West Virginia and hit the territory of the Eagles, the reigning champions against perhaps this season's favorites. The Eagles have dominated so far, 7-0 in the first. Randall Cunningham here on a design run, cuts it back inside. He's going to break a tackle, spin away from someone else, and get in for the touchdown. A lot of people thought Randall Cunningham should have been 1990s NFL MVP. Maybe he should have. This game wasn't close. 21 at the half. The Eagles kick four field goals in the second half, win by a final score of 33-10. to It certainly wasn't just Randall Cunningham. Reggie White wrecked havoc. Five sacks, two forced fumbles, and a fumble recovery in this game. There will not be a repeat winner this season. The Bengals are out. The Eagles take over their land. And while they weren't officially ranked as a top-five team, on talent, this Eagles team may be the best. With the Chargers now out, there's still some underdog teams left. The Bills are not one of those teams, and neither are their opponents here. They're heading southwest to face the Eagles, a big test for both teams. Although maybe not for the Eagles. They've jumped out to a lead again. It's 14-0. They're driving for more. Randall Cunningham finds Anthony Tony. He gets it the rest of the way in. The Eagles, at home, mind you, are all over. The Bills, 21 to nothing, and this was a blowout. Philadelphia beats the number one ranked Buffalo Bills, 42 to seven. The Eagles win this game by 35. So far in 1990 imperialism, the largest margin of victory, and they did it against the number one ranked team. Maybe the Eagles should be ranked number one. They take over Buffalo's territory, and speaking of the top five, only the Raiders from that list at number five remain. After a long round of expansion, we now have a game lined up. The Denver Broncos will take on the Houston Oilers. It was a defensive battle in the first quarter, but now in the second, the Broncos are at the Oiler 15-yard line. Elway stays in the pocket. The Oilers lose track of tight end Clarence K. That's going to be the game's opening touchdown. The Broncos go up 
seven to nothing. Now Houston's turn with their high-powered passing attack. This is third and one, though. Up the middle, no, it's play action. Warren Moon's gonna find Haywood Jeffries in the end zone for the touchdown. Great play call there on third and one, knowing you can go for it on fourth. We're tied at seven, that's the halftime score. We now take it to the third quarter. The Broncos are punting. Mike Horan is holding this ball too long, and that punt is blocked, and the Oilers are going to pick it up and run it back some. They've got it down now to second and goal from the five-yard line. Warren Mood facing the pressure. Steve Atwater picks off the forced pass. Opportunity lost. The Broncos now have it third down from the Oilers' 20. They need 15 yards. This pass to Vance Johnson, it's not going to get it. Selling for a field goal, it's now 10-7 Denver. Houston's trying to respond, we're now in the fourth quarter. Warren Moon dumps off a pass, goes nowhere, also leads to a field goal. They've got it back though, 55 seconds to go. Warren Moon gets it to Drew Hill inside the 10. With under a minute to go, the Oilers are gonna bring out kicker Teddy Garcia for the game winner from 32 yards out. It's true. And despite these two teams having high-powered offenses, the Oilers win a low-scoring defensive battle, 13-10. There's some upside to all of that, though. If the Oilers can win with defense, they'll have a chance to take this whole thing. They will take the Broncos off the map, expanding their land and getting us ever closer to the end. The Patriots have played keep away for long enough. They're going to have to take the field. And as the lowest ranked team in 1990, they got to go to Philly. The Eagles have Jim McMahon in for the injured Randall Cunningham. It's third and 10 for the Patriot 25. From the shotgun, McMahon's going to loft it up to Fred Barnett, who extends out to make the catch. That gives the Eagles a 27 to seven lead. This one was a laugher, even though the Patriots scored first. 41 to seven is the final score. The Eagles keep chugging along with nothing seemingly able to get in their way. They are now the last surviving team in the Northeast as they wipe the Patriots off the map. With only six teams remaining on the wheel, it will select the Atlanta Falcons and send them to the Northwest. So after all the expansion that Atlanta has done, they now run into the territory of the Minnesota Vikings. Atlanta hung in this one for a while, only down by four at the half, but the Vikings are proving too much. Rich Gannon throws this touchdown pass to Rick Fenny, just broke the goal line there. That extends Minnesota's lead to 35 to 10, and they didn't let up before the game ended. Final score of this one, Minnesota 49, Atlanta 17. In 1989, the Minnesota Vikings made the infamous trade for Herschel Walker. And in his first game, he rushed for over 100 yards, but never had such a game again in 89 or 90. In imperialism in this game, he ran for 164 yards to help them get the win. The Atlanta Falcons have been eliminated. The Vikings take over their territory and they now stretch from the northern border down to the tip of Florida. Our next game is going to get us down to four teams. We land on the Eagles. They're going to head west. There was a small chance they were going to expand into Rhode Island. Instead, they're heading to Minnesota to face the Vikings. First quarter, Eagles lead 3-0, but the Vikings are driving. From the 22-yard line, Rich Gannon's going to look for who else? Anthony Carter. Catch and run into the end zone. The Vikings score the game's first touchdown. They take a 7-3 lead. We head now to the second quarter. The Eagles have gotten it down to about the 15-yard line. Keith Byers will go up the middle, spins away, and will score for the Eagles. They now have taken the lead 10-7. The Eagles defense gets them the ball right back and they've taken it down to the two yard line. Second and goal. Anthony Tony's blown up by Chris Dolman. He fumbles. What a lucky play for the Vikings. Very unlucky for the Eagles. 
The Vikings take that drive down to the 26. This pitch goes out to Herschel Walker. Gets around right end. Down the sideline. They catch him at the four-yard line. It is now third and goal from the one. Rich Gannon's going to throw this ball, and it's going to go to Anthony Carter, and it's going to be a touchdown. Here in the first half, we've already had three lead changes. The Vikings now go ahead 14-10. to Minnesota on defense now. The Eagles have the ball. Randall Cunningham throws to Anthony Toney. Gets across the middle. He's fighting off tacklers, and he fumbles for the second time. Minnesota keeps on making plays when they need to. Philly keeps falling apart. They're running this back to about midfield. The Eagles have the ball again from the 45. Cunningham is going to throw deep to Calvin Williams. He'll make the catch and get it down to the 8-yard line. But the Eagles are forced all the way back. This will be a 32-yard field goal attempt. Roger Ruzek lines it up, and he misses. Goodness gracious, the Vikings now have it. Minute 25 to go. Rich Gannon, play action. He's going to look for Anthony Carter. Carter's going to make the catch inside the 10. The Vikings run out the clock. A lot happened in that second half. Nobody scored. The Vikings hold on. They win this game 14-10. to This really felt like it could be the year for the Eagles during the Buddy Ryan era. But there's something about the Minnesota Vikings in imperialism. They beat the Eagles. They take them off the map. This is, by the numbers, not a great team. They were 6-10 in 1990. But when imperialism comes on, all they seem to do is win. The Raiders get one expansion, but now they're heading into Houston to face the Oilers. These are Tecmo Super Bowl simulations, right? Well, in that case, we need to see a Bo Jackson touchdown. And that's exactly what the Raiders get here as time is expiring in the first half. The Oilers passing game was shut down in this one. The Raiders lead 17-0 after that touchdown. They come away with a 31-14 final score victory. We're now down to our final three teams. The Los Angeles Raiders will eliminate the Houston Oilers, and the Raiders join the Vikings along with, you may have forgotten, the New Orleans Saints, sitting there in Louisiana, not having moved an inch. The wheel finally landed on the New Orleans Saints, and after an expansion, they now have to travel to Minnesota to play the Vikings. That will put the LA Raiders in the Imperialism Championship game. Who will they be playing? It's a good thing for the Saints that they have an all-time great kicker, in fact, a Hall of Fame kicker. Their offense hasn't been able to do much, but Morton Anderson's kicking field goals for them. These are the first two that he made. That made it 6-0. Now here in the third quarter, this field goal made it 9 nothing. while the defense has been holding up. The Vikings are trying to break through that, though. From their own 41-yard line, Wade Wilson steps back, looks deep for Hassan Jones, makes the catch down the sideline. Can the Saints catch up to him? They do. They get him down at about the 2-yard line. But on the very next play, this pitch goes out to Rick Fenney, and he'll get into the end zone. So the Vikings have finally scored here, and in doing so, they have made this a one-score game. It's 9-7, and the Vikings are getting the ball back at about their own 20-yard line. The Saints back up their defense, anticipating a pass. That is what happens, but Pat Swilling breaks through, gets the strip sack. That ball is loose, and the Saints recover, and they get it down inside the one. First play now of the fourth quarter. Craig Hayward goes up the middle. Ironhead scoring the touchdown for the Saints, giving them a 16-7 lead. They locked it down from there. The Saints finally show up at Imperialism, go to Minnesota, and win this game 16-7.
We saw some runs in this imperialism from two teams with losing records, the San Diego Chargers and the Minnesota Vikings, but neither of them could get this far. Our 1990 championship game is set. The LA Raiders looking to win their first imperialism title since 1974 and their first in Los Angeles. And the New Orleans Saints are looking to become the second consecutive team to win imperialism after a season in which they went 8-8. Eight and eight. Let's spin this wheel and find out where this game's going to be played. And here is that spin. It's going to land on the Raiders. So they're going to travel to New Orleans. 1990's Imperialism Championship is on the line. The Saints are forced to rely on Morton Anderson early on again. This is a 32-yard field goal attempt, and he misses. That's potentially a bad omen. On the next drive, the Raiders on their own 40-yard line. Play action. Jay Schrader fires deep to Mervin Fernandez. Great throw, but Fernandez picks up a lot of extra yards. It's a 45-yard play. The Raiders are now at the three-yard line. First and goal, the handoff will go to Marcus Allen, and he gets in. First touchdown of the game, first points of the game. The Raiders take a 7 to nothing lead. Later into the first quarter, the Saints have it at their own 45. Steve Walsh looking for his tight end, Hobie Brenner. That's intercepted by Terry McDaniel. The Raiders turn that into a field goal. 10 to nothing is the score. LA has the ball. Their own 33-yard line. Schrader rolls out. Throws to Fernandez. Perfect throw. He cuts on a dime and picks up a lot more yards. Schrader to Fernandez working brilliantly. With little time left in the half, the Raiders will settle for the field goal. It's good. They go into the half, leaving 13 to nothing. The Raiders have it deep in Saint territory again. The Saints defense has tried to stop them. The Raiders stuffed on first and second down, calling an audible. Schrader is this time going to throw it to Marcus Allen for the touchdown. The Raiders have punched away, taken a 20 to nothing lead. The Saints offense just couldn't get anything going in what is the first and only shutout in this season's imperialism. The Raiders save it for the title game and beat the Saints 34 to nothing. And with that victory, the Raiders claim the entire United States as their own territory. For the second time, the Raiders are imperialism champions, and for the first time, the Los Angeles Raiders are imperialism champions. Because of their geographical proximity, it was inevitable that the Super Bowl contestants would play each other at some point in imperialism, and that came to pass with the Bills defeating the Giants. Then the Bills promptly lost their next game. The Imperialism title game instead came down to the Los Angeles Raiders and the New Orleans Saints, with the Raiders easily coming out on top. It's probably good for the Raiders that they avoided Buffalo, since they lost to them in the 1990 AFC title game by a resounding 51-3 score. Yet, the Raiders were a 12-4 team and had an excellent roster. Willie Galt and Mervyn Fernandez led the offense, really showing out in Imperialism receiving passes from Jay Schrader. The backfield combo of Marcus Allen and Bo Jackson was lightning in a bottle. But as usual, nothing happens here without the offensive line. With an incredible interior of Don Mosbar, Steve Wisniewski, and Max Montoya. Montoya incidentally wins his second straight imperialism title, having played for the Bengals in 1989. The Raiders' defense was balanced across the board with a great pass rush duo in Greg Townsend and future Hall of Famer Howie Long. The starting secondary may have been 1990's best, with Lionel Washington and Terry McDaniel locking down the corner spots, and Eddie Anderson teaming with Mike Harden in the safety spots. 1990's games saw two go to overtime, and they both involved the upstart San Diego Chargers. In the first half of games, they went into Seattle and won that game, while in the second half of games, they fell at home to the eventual champion Raiders. Scoring in general was steady without any shutouts until that final game. The Raiders top 1990s standings because of their win in that final game, while three teams did win more games than them, including the real-life sub-500 Vikings and Chargers, as well as the team that was looking like the favorite the most of the way, the Philadelphia Eagles. The Bears and the Oilers also won on the field more than once. In the overall standings, the Cowboys have finally been knocked off the top, 
with their 51 total victories, falling short of the 53 now attained by the Minnesota Vikings. The next few seasons give Dallas a chance to rectify that. The Raiders slide in at 20 and 23 and are the only two-time imperialism winner with a losing record, mostly because their two imperialism wins brought a total of four victories. And although the Seahawks and the Buccaneers officially sit at the bottom of these standings, it is now the Denver Broncos, despite appearing in four Super Bowls during this era, who sit with the lowest win percentage. Thank you so much for joining us. This was our 25th imperialism with many more to come. Please consider giving the video a like and sharing it with a friend or two. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on future imperialisms and other content the channel is putting out. One more look here at the silver and black that unites America. Just like in the real world, the Raiders have now won an imperialism title both in Oakland and in Los Angeles. They'll be back the next season for 1991 looking to repeat, and I hope that you're back with us as well. Thank you all so very much, and I hope you have an awesome day.